Today we are joined by Ian Fife. Let me just turn this on. Um, Ian is the Forest Birds Program Coordinator with Birds Canada. In his role, Ian works with the forestry industry and on the ground forestry technicians to protect and conserve avian diversity and species at risk in the Carolinian region of Southern Ontario. Today, Ian's going to be discussing how the forestry and conservation sectors can work together to identify common grounds to protect and conserve forest birds and their habitat, while also maintaining one of Ontario's leading economic exports. Um, so Ian, now that you have the screen going in your intro, um, please take it away. All right, thanks, Alison. Um, uh, so yeah, as Alison mentioned, uh, I'm Ian Fife. I'm the Forest Birds Program Coordinator with Birds Canada. So for those of you who do, don't know who we are, we are a national organization and the only organization in Canada that addresses issues surrounding all wild birds. We are a nonprofit charitable organization uh, built on the contributions from thousands of members and citizen scientists. Our mission is to conserve wild birds through sound science, on the ground action, innovative partnerships, public engagement and science-based advocacy and we consider ourselves as your voice for birds. So, all right, when, when people picture forestry, uh, if there, or if there's uh, environmental discussion on, in the news around forestry, they usually show a picture that looks something like this. Uh, and yes, this does occur and it is occurring. However, uh, most forest harvesting, especially in Southern Ontario, uh, looks uh, something like this. Uh, the difference between the two really depends on the management goals for the forests, and, and I will get into that. Um, I also imagine when some people think of forestry and forest birds together, what they picture is some sort of main event, a good versus bad sort of deal. So uh, depending on that person's perspective, um, uh, both, both sides are right, and I will get into more of that later on as well. Uh, but rather than looking at it as uh, this versus that or us versus them, uh, I, I choose to look at it as how do we get from this to that or how can we work so this gives us that. So to put it into a more specific question, how can we use forestry and conservation to create, maintain, or restore forest bird habitat? And with that said, um, there will be circumstances where the actions of tree harvesting will not work with forest birds, and I will also get into those circumstances uh, as well. Um, so to start off, part one, I'll cover some basic forestry details like terminology, types of forestry, and forestry economics. Um, part two will be the bulk of the presentation. This is where I'll briefly discuss how birds respond to most common to the most common wood harvesting methods. And when I say briefly, I simply mean I can only touch on bits and pieces of the research available. Um, I could do an entire presentation on forest birds and only one type of harvest. Um, in part three, I'll discuss uh, issues both uh, facing both the forestry industry and forest birds. And finally, I'll be speaking, uh, and finally, I'll speak about what you can do to, to aid in bird conservation. Uh, so there are a few important forestry related to words that I would like to define uh, before we move forward uh, so that I will be clear when discussing certain forestry methods. So the first term is civil culture, uh, and this is the art and science of controlling the establishment, the growth, uh, the composition, the quality of the forest vegetation uh, for a full range of forest resource objectives. So if you were to harvest all the trees in the area, you'd be applying a clear cut civil cultural method. An uneven aged forest structure means the forest has three or more age classes, and this type of structure is a result of increasing species age and size class diversity within a forest. And then an even aged forest, which means, uh, which means that the difference between the oldest and the youngest trees, uh, there is no difference between the oldest and the youngest trees. So uh, an area that is, is planned to be harvested on a 50 year rotation means that no trees in that area are gonna be greater than 50 years old. And the difference between those younger and uh, older trees are, is no more than 10 years. Um, I'll keep this slide short and sweet. So when should harvesting occur to protect birds? It should always occur outside of the bird breeding season, uh, especially where sensitive species at risk are concerned. The prime breeding in uh, southern Ontario is pictured here is April to early August. And that timeline gets, uh, um, gets shorter as the more north you go. Uh, the harvest taking place during time uh, during uh, prime breeding season run the risk of destroying nests and eggs and also potentially killing the adults. 
So with respect to our national economic output, Canada is second uh, second in the world of exporting, uh, second in the world for exporting wood products, just slightly behind China. As of 2019, uh, wood products account for about 3% of Canada's total exports and is seventh among Canada's top 10 exports. Uh, Canada has contributed, or sorry, wood has contributed almost $26 billion to the national economy and generated $70 billion in revenue. Oddly enough, China is our major export market as well as the US uh, and both countries account for about 81% of all wood product sales. Uh, the national forestry industry employs more than 200,000 people. A little closer to home is uh, in Ontario. It's the third largest forest products producer after Quebec and BC. Uh, accounts for 21% of Canada's total, uh, Canada's GDP. Uh, contributing just over 14, or sorry, $4 billion to the national economy and $14.5 billion to in revenue. Uh, there are around 45,000 people employed in the forestry industry in Ontario. So there are three main civil culture methods I'll be talking about today, the, the clear cut, the shelter wood, and selection cutting. Uh, I would like to preface uh, this uh, with uh, before I get into these civil culture methods, that there are many variations and modifications that can be made within all of these systems, but I, I can't discuss them all here today, so I'm going to just stick with those main main methods. Um, so essentially, a clear cut is uh, the removal of most of the overstory within a given area, usually for a specific type of tree. And in Ontario, those those trees include poplar, pine, spruce, and fir. Uh, they, these, those trees usually require some type of natural disturbance in order to regenerate, such as jack pine, which requires a wildfire to release the seeds within the cones. Um, the clear-cut method is the primary method used in the boreal forest in northern Ontario and uh, accounts for about 80% of the wood harvesting that occurs up there. Um, the clear-cutting also occurs in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence regions of eastern and central Ontario. Um, to what extent, though, I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, clear cut sizes can also uh, vary um, fr uh, from as small as a few hectares to as large as a few hundred hectares. Uh, the method is designed to create an even aged stand that can be harvested once again the trees once the trees have reached maturity. Uh, although it's an added cost, the forestry industry will use uh, tree planting after a harvest rather than natural regeneration. Uh, and this is just to allow for a quicker regeneration time or turnaround time. And, that, and also to ensure that the, the growing stock remains the same. Uh, from an economic point of view, clear cuts are, are an efficient method when looking to harvest a large a volume of wood product from the area. It also reduces the amount of area disturbed uh, from harvesting by removing all trees rather than every other tree, you know, if you're looking to, to get the same volume of wood. Um, a clear cut harvest has evolved a long way since it was first practiced, and the goals of the harvest are now uh, more to, in, in, to uh, imitate a natural disturbance. So, historically, areas used to be cut in large, several large squares with every tree removed, and any waste that was left behind was piled up and burned, uh, and assuming that the whole tree had not been used. Um, uh, clear cut then adopted the residual tree practice, and this left uh, scattered trees throughout the harvested area, uh, but maintained that square block. Um, these residual trees provided the area with an abundance of seed bearing fruits and cones, and they also provided uh, the, a good genetic stock, which essentially meant that they kept all the tall straight trees. Um, and some of these residual trees also provide habitat for wildlife. And for the most part, a modern clear cut harvest area has uh, the ecological importance of the area in mind, but, and that includes imitating natural disturbances. Uh, residual trees remain, but uh, islands of trees have now been uh, inputted and that, they're referred to as wildlife refuges. Uh, and uh, this practice uh, provides a little bit more ecological depth and dynamics to a cut area. And it also further imitates that natural occurrence such as wildfire or an insect outbreak. So for an example of how a clear cut harvest imitates a wildfire, you can see in the wildfire photo on the left, you can make out the peninsulas and islands of live trees um, in the harvested area. And as well as in the harvested area, you can see many examples of the same. Um, ecologically, this provides uh, wildlife refuges and edge habitat, which many birds utilize. 
Um, it also reduces the, it also reduces fragmentation and increases connectivity within the harvest area for, for small migrating wildlife such as amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, uh, and creates that shorter distance from, from one, uh, one stand to the next. So wildfires leave a lot of individual standing dead trees within the burned area. Um, harvesting is similar in that they retain as many dead trees as possible as wild, for wildlife trees. Um, however, leaving these dead trees and, and leaving these dead trees has been an industry standard for decades. Uh, but the obvious difference between the two is the, uh, the pure numbers of dead trees available between the two. Um, Additionally, dead standing snags from a wildfire remain a lot longer on the landscape and they provide, which provides more opportunity for birds that rely on dead trees for nesting and roosting. And finally, we can see in both that there are no straight lines um, that create the border between these two areas. So for birds and other wildlife, this creates an opportunity for species that are associated with forest edges and early successional habitat. Uh, the rounded edges also mean that, that there's more edge habitat available and also provides a, sort of a visual blinder, if you will, from territorial conspecific species. Um, our shelter wood harvest is a gradual removal of all mature trees and a series of harvests spaced out over time. So someone employing a shelter wood harvest would harvest the mature trees and then return some years later to remove more mature trees and more of a cyclical method of, of silviculture. And the amount of time between, uh, a, a sustainable amount of time between shelter wood harvests is typically 10 to 30 years. Um, the purpose of this method is to ma uh, maintain shade uh, while allowing uh, saplings more room to grow. Uh, the goal of a shelter wood harvest is to have an ecologically healthy, even aged vertical structure uh, with a mid tolerant hardwood composition within the forest. And some of the trees that are targeted, targeted in this method include ash, hickory, elm, oak, some maples and white pine, with white pine really being the only mid tolerant coniferous tree species we have in Ontario. Uh, so the idea behind a shelter wood harvest is that it's completed in anywhere from two to four cuts. Uh, the example I'll show here is a three to four cut method. Uh, and so the first prep cut is done when once the trees have reached maturity, which is usually about 60 to 80 years old. Um, this cut removes over mature trees, poor quality and diseased trees, as well as um, undesirable species such as birch and poplar. Um, the purpose of this is to provide room for these healthier seed trees to grow and increase their seed bearing potential. And then the seed cut is applied when trees are about 20 years older, 80 to 100 years old. And depending on the age of the forest, you could either uh, begin at the prep or seed cut, or you can actually do them both at the same time. Um, so uh, the seed cut uh, actually opens the crown uh, to about 50% cover, uh, but it retains the tallest, straightest, and healthiest tree to produce seeds for natural regeneration. And the first removal takes uh, another 50% of the remaining uh, mature trees and creates the partial sunlight uh, the seedlings and saplings require to take off. Uh, another important factor that must be considered during this cut is to, is, uh, is to ensure the regeneration from the seed and the prep cut remain as undisturbed as possible. So if the young trees are providing regeneration to the area and they become wounded during the first removal, uh, that compromises the health of the regenerating stock. So tree root and tree roots uh, uh, reduce growth. They increase the tree's susceptibility to disease or reduce the tree's quality. Um, the final removal cut uh, removes the majority of the remaining trees. Uh, any trees left standing here are likely to be tall, uh, large seed trees. Uh, if diversity is important to the health of the forest, uh, then the seed trees uh, should also be diverse. Uh, by this time, the young trees have become established. And then finally, if all things are going right, you are left with a healthy, mid-tolerant, even-aged forest. Uh, the final silviculture method are so selection harvests. Uh, so these systems target uh, shade-tolerant uh, trees such as maple and beech. Uh, they aim for an even, I'm sorry, an uneven-aged forest composition with trees of all ages present. 
Uh, the two methods most commonly used in uh, Southern Ontario are the selection harvest uh, of selection harvest, our single tree selection and group selection. Uh, both methods aim to remove 33% of the trees in the harvest area. The difference being between the two is that uh, single tree selection removes every third tree throughout the harvested area, whereas group selection removes all trees in small gaps. And so those gaps, those gaps that are created from group selection, they can be, they can range in size from 0.1 hectares to 2 hectares. And for a size reference here, an NHL hockey rink is about 0.2 hectares and a major league baseball field is two and a half hectares. Uh, the selection systems are the most difficult systems to implement because you're aiming to target a certain density of trees based off the diameter of the trees surveyed and the, to and the total number of trees in the forested area. Okay, so for part two, I'll focus my discussion on two important avian metrics and those are uh, species composition and species richness. Uh, I'll, I'll also talk about the importance to protect species at risk from disturbance. So species composition simply refers to a community of, uh, of animals and in this context, the bird community. Uh, so among, uh, among birds, these communities or guilds as they're usually called are grouped together based on some behavioral patterns such as where they prefer to nest. So ground nesters or mid-story nesters. Um, or uh, on what or where they prefer to feed. So for example, aerial, aerial insectivores is a, is a foraging guild. Um, so species richness is a measure of diversity and in its simplest terms simply mean, uh, means how many different species are found in the area. Um, so how does species composition and, and richness change after a disturbance? Uh, so beginning with clear-cut harvest, this study looked at bird abundance at two age-related habitats, the early successional and the mature forest. Uh, the early successional species associated with that habitat, such as the hooded warbler, responded positively, but did not respond immediately. And that's indicated there uh, uh, by the gray, uh, sorry, the gray square just slightly above that dashed vertical line. Um, however, the indigo bunting responded very well to a clear-cut. A few other early successional species are also represented um, after a clear cut harvest, and that's the, uh, the black and white warbler and the Carolina wren, um, all, both responding positively. Uh, but it's the eastern towhee and the white eyed vireo, along with the indigo bunting, that responded very well to these clear cut harvests. Um, so, why don't we clear cut in southern Ontario for forest birds? Well, first, most woodlots in southern Ontario are privately owned. Uh, clear cutting a forest means waiting 60 to 120 years to regenerate before you can do anything with it again. If the forest is providing any economic value, a clear cut provides very little return in the long run. Instead, private landowners are, uh, can use these forests to sell firewood yearly or implement small harvests every 15 to 20 years to maximize uh, the economic output of their forests. Um, another reason why clear cutting shouldn't take place in southern Ontario with respect to birds is there is no real concern for early successional and edge associated bird species. Uh, the amount of uh, habitat fragmentation in southern Ontario ensures that this group of birds have, has a relatively stable population. Uh, however, in northern Ontario, uh, clear cut could help early successional species and increase bird diversity, which I will discuss um, how shortly. Uh, but I'll look at the mature forest bird species uh, before that. Um, so the mature forest species are often associated with uh, nesting, uh, occupying the mid-story, um, occupying the mid-story and the overstory of the tree canopy. Uh, these species saw a reduction in population of upwards of 75% in the clear-cut harvest. Uh, in this graph here, the oven bird, which is associated with old growth forests and nests on the ground, was the species that fared the worst in a clear cut, um, followed closely by the red eye vireo and the Acadian flycatcher, both of which prefer overhead cover and uh, the mid story uh, of, uh, and a mid story of trees uh, from three to 10 meters to connect them. So with respect to species at risk, the Acadian flycatcher, cerulean warbler, and wood thrush are all associated with either a late or mature successional forest. The Acadian flycatcher and cerulean are, uh, are endangered in Canada. The wood thrush is a species of special concern. Um, 
The Acadian flycatcher, however, is only found in the Carolinian region of southwestern Ontario where clear cut harvesting doesn't take place. However, the cerulean warbler and the wood thrush can be found in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region where clear cut harvesting does occur. Other species at risk that may benefit from a clear cut harvest are any species that prefer open areas such as swallows. Uh, most swallows, with the exception of the tree swallow, are considered a species of risk, but uh, I should I should mention that that will also depend on the available habitat and, and you can't just open up an area for swallows. Um, the size of the clear cut is also positively correlated with species richness. So this study here looked at different sizes of clear cut and the number of species detected among those different sizes. The results suggested that as the size of the clear cut area increased, so did the number of different species. Uh, the authors provided two ecological reasons for uh, why this may have occurred. First, because the, because the cut area was larger, this allowed for more uh, heterogeneous landscape and allowed for a variety of bird species habitat. Uh, the smaller cuts would be more homogeneous and support a lower number of species, or a lower number of different species. Uh, a second, a larger clear cut also provided available space for species that hold larger territories and so they were more likely in, to be encountered during surveys. So as a refresher, a shelter wood system is completed in two to four stages with the goal of achieving an even aged forest of mid tolerant trees. Um, so because a shelter wood harvest leaves mature trees and allows for regeneration between cuts, uh, they are able to provide a slightly wider range of bird species compared to a clear cut. Uh, canopy nesting and shrub nesting guilds of birds dominated after a, sh a shelter wood harvest. So canopy nesting species like the uh, bla blue gray gnat catcher, uh, the yellow throated vireo increased substantially after a uh, shelter wood harvest, as did the eastern wood peewee and the scarlet tanager. So shrub nesting, but shrub nesting species overall were 155% greater than in shelter wood harvest than unharvested areas. So this shouldn't really come as a surprise as uh, shrubs and other short vegetation are quite dense one to three years after a harvest. And similar species that were present after a clear cut were also present in a shelter wood harvest. So the Eastern Tohe and Carolina Wren, which I mentioned earlier, uh, were more abundant than uh, the Prairie Warbler and Indigo Bunting, but uh, all each of these species saw a major increase in abundance after a shelter wood harvest. However, after three years, uh, the, all of these species numbers had dropped to mature forest stands, uh, sorry, to mature forest stand levels. So the late successional species are mid-story species and ground nesting species were negatively associated with shelter wood harvesting, resulting in a, a 35 to 45% decrease in density uh, within these nesting guilds. Uh, these, species, uh, these species like the wood thrush and Acadian flycatcher are very sensitive to disturbances and don't fare too well under most harvest, harvesting systems, if at all. Um, um, more common species like the red eye vireo, which is a mid-story nester, and the oven bird, the ground nester, also saw significant declines after a shelter wood harvest. So similar to a forest edge, species richness and number of birds increased with an overlap of early and late successional forest habitat species. So in this study, Newell and Roadwald were able to consistently identify a higher measure of species richness at all stages of a shelter wood harvest when compared to a mature forest stand. So this includes uh, species that were less abundant prior to harvest but had immigrated into the recently harvested stands. Uh, species such as the yellow-breasted chat, uh, the blue-winged warbler, uh, the cedar waxwings, and Baltimore orioles were commonly found in some of these shelter wood harvested areas. Uh, species, at species at risk noted in the aforementioned studies were present and their response was variable. Uh, cerulean warbler were 200% higher in one shelter wood stand. Um, however, this number was a, uh, an outlier and most of the um, uh, uh, most of the cerulean warblers did not increase uh, significantly with between the shelter wood and unharvested areas. So the possible reason for um, the lack of significance and why this one did so well 
uh, or why this stand did so well with cerulean warblers is that uh, it was based on the topography of the surrounding habitat. So cerulean warblers are often found on slopes, singing out over an open area. However, uh, however, this result does give the forestry industry and bird conservationists like myself kind of a starting point to, to restore habitat to a bird that is endangered throughout its North American range. Um, so the eastern wood peewee uh, was also greater in uh, shelter wood stands, but at a much lower abundance compared to other more common species. Um, as for the mid-story nesters that saw a reduction in abundance, uh, our, our species at risk, such as wood thrush and the Acadian flycatcher, really saw significant declines in the shelter wood harvest stands compared to their unharvested areas. All right, switching our attention to a selection cut. And for a refresher here, selection cut is intended to remove 33% of the forest. Occurs most frequently in two methods, the single tree and the, um, the group selection. And the goal of a selection cut is to achieve an uneven aged forest. So looking at single tree selection, uh, Jobes and others looked at uh, two time periods after, after a harvest. Um, they looked at a recent harvest, which occurred within, four, within five years of the study. And they looked at an old harvest, which had occurred uh, between 15 to 20 years after, uh, with, before the study. So what they had found was that species that were negatively affected um, by the system uh, were, uh, were oven birds and yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Um, yellow-bellied sapsuckers declined uh, only uh, slightly uh, uh, recently after a harvest, but uh, significantly were decl had declined uh, after the 15 to 20 years. Uh, and this may have been a result of lower volume of living deciduous trees that they used for foraging and nesting. Um, the oven bird, on the other hand, declined by 50%. Uh, as I've mentioned before, they are a closed canopy, old growth ground nesting species sensitive to disturbance. And with the increased shrub uh, uh, layer, uh, sorry, with the increased shrub layer growing, the removal of some canopy trees and the disturbed ground from mechanized harvesting in the recently harvested area, this may have left uh, little nesting habitat or territorial resources uh, where the harvesting took place. And even after 15 to 20 years, uh, the population still had not returned to reference levels. Um, early successional species like the chestnut-sided warbler, the white-throated sparrow, and the morning warbler all responded positively in the recently logged um, uh, single tree selection areas. Uh, but, after tw uh, but after 15 to 20 years, they had all returned back to those reference levels. Um, conveniently, Campbell and others reported on both species richness and bird abundance after a group selection harvest over a 20 year time period. Um, what they had determined is that some of the mature forest bird community had remained uh, and the early successional species temporarily benefited from a group selection and that lasted about eight years before declining back to the reference level, which was a common theme among all uh, silvicultural methods is that, um, that early success, those early successional species uh, benefited uh, temporarily and for short term, uh, typically less than 10 years. Uh, we're referring to the graph here, uh, density represented as the bird community population shown in the triangles or the two bottom lines uh, did not really change much throughout the 20 years. And without going too far in depth of this study, um, this, this graph merely suggests that various species of birds used up their respective ecological niches, regardless of whether it was managed or not. Um, whereas species richness, and that's represented by the two top lines, uh, remained similar uh, immediately at, after the harvest, but, start, but started to diverge after around the sixth year in the group selection managed areas. And that showed an inc and started to show an increase in species richness. So as the managed area started to fill in with regeneration, we are likely seeing how a variable vertical structure increases diversity under these managed collection systems. Uh, but does gap size matter for diversity? So Greenberg and others looked at this question and found that a gap size was positively related to species richness. Gap size in this study ranged from 0.1 to 1.4 hectares. Uh, the researchers reported three possibilities for these results. Uh, first, the larger gap size provided habitat to a larger group of birds that prefer second growth habitat. 
They also suggested that there's a higher selection of birds within foraging and nesting guilds. And then finally, they also mentioned that juvenile birds that are associated with more of an interior forest habitat preference had been evicted from ideal habitat by older, more experienced birds and had to settle for less ha suitable habitat in order to breed. Um, so I've made the case identifying possible areas where conservation and forestry can work together. Bird communities may change and species richness is higher in most cases after a partial or full harvest due to heterogeneous habitats available to birds. However, we still must be reluctant to say that forestry helps all birds. It seems to help most common birds. Uh, however, in most every harvesting situation where species at risk was present, it resulted in a loss of abundance and habitat for those birds. And some leeway could and may be given to less threatened species, such as the eastern wood peewee that appear to do well, uh, do well among uh, partial harvest cuts. Uh, it is important to ensure that all forests have a proper management plan and at the very least include a, bear, a bird species list. Um, the habitat surrounding species at risk should be protected, especially endangered species. Uh, most industrial and crown land areas have a management plan. However, private wood loaners, private woodlot owners uh, also own a large proportion of forests, especially in southern Ontario. And if they are, if they don't already have a, a management plan, they, sh they should be encouraged to develop a forest management plan as well. Um, so with some common benefits linked between forest harvesting and bird conservation by the examples I gave, uh, so what common challenges are our forests and birds facing? Um, first is climate change. How can I not talk about climate change, right? So it affects us all. Um, forests regulate ecosystems, they protect biodiversity, uh, they play an integral part in the carbon cycle, and they support goods and services that drive sustainable growth. Unlike most other ecosystems, such as grasslands, forests are more resilient to the effects of climate change, and they're able to absorb uh, up to uh, a one third of the world's CO2 emissions. Um, climate change on forests will likely alter the frequency and intensity of forest disturbances. And this includes uh, insect outbreaks, invasive species, wildfires, and storms. Um, insect outbreaks defoliate weaken and kill trees and increase temperatures along with a lack of predators and natural controls will allow insects to spread their range into new areas. Uh, this will increase the severity of the outbreaks and it also allow those insects to develop faster and alter their seasonal life cycles. The warming temperature and drought conditions will also increase the extent and severity of wildfires uh, and frequency of wildfires. So furthermore, in some areas, the drought water availability will decrease, uh, and this will make fighting wildfires uh, that much harder. Additionally, a wildfire releases CO2 at a much rapid rate and exponentially increases the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that further contributes to climate. Uh, weather storms will become more severe, destroying forests through wind and ice storms. Um, an interesting fact about Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005, they had destroyed 5,500 acres of forest. So the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere as a result of those storms was the equivalent of all the carbon sequestered by every U.S. forest in a single year. Uh, climate change will also affect uh, forest growth and productivity. So Productivity and distribution of forests will change as temperatures rise. Increased temperatures will shift the geographic ranges of some trees as pictured in the photo on the left. Uh, the amount of precipitation could also be a problem for forests as some areas will face risks of drought and others a risk of flooding. Uh, although some trees are resilient to some level of drought, uh, this coupled with increased temperatures would be more damaging as dry trees and shrubs just provide fuel for wildfires. Um, additionally, uh, habitat for birds and other wildlife will shift north and when species become at risk of extinction, sorry, could become at risk of extinction, especially if their habitat is no longer available. So because birds are much easier to study, birds have been the metric for how uh, the natural world has reacted to climate change. And based on uh, changing bird populations, we can to make assumptions about how certain resources like insects are doing and how bird populations are affected uh, by this by these changes 
Um, in the graph on the left, aerial insectivores, shorebirds, and grassland birds are the quickest declining bird groups in Canada. So entire groups of birds that rely primarily on insects for food on the breeding grounds are severely declining. I refuse to believe that that can be a coincidence. Uh, my personal opinion is, is that climate change is a major factor in this. Uh, there is a lot of research currently being done across North America on insects trying to determine the cause of these bird group declines. So here's one example of what is happening to some of our birds under climate change. So this infographic is essentially showing what is happening with birds when affected by the mismatch hypothesis. So the theory, uh, this theory is a relatively new theory. It uh, came about in the late 1990s. So here on the left, we have a moment in time indicated as 1980 and the red dashed line corresponding well to hatchling food requirements uh, with the peak insect abundance on the bottom. On the right, we have our present day with warming temperatures and we can see that peak insect abundance is actually is now earlier, while the hatchlings provisional resources remain constant or provisional the resource needs remain constant. Um, because their food source has peaked earlier in the season due to warming temperatures, nestlings are not getting enough provisions from the adults, uh, which results in many things, including not being prepared to migrate or even if, if, if they do leave for migration, they may not have enough energy stored to make it to their winter grounds. So for a study example of the mismatch hypothesis, this graph here, uh, this, the graphs here show a study completed on the Sanderling, which is a small shorebird that breeds in the Arctic and migrates to South America for the winter. Um, graph A in the top uh, left shows the date of insect emergence becoming earlier with each year, uh, uh, with sorry, with each year, uh, while within the same time frame, graph B on the upper right shows the Sanderling's uh, hatch date remaining similar, with only a slight uh, decrease in uh, in hatch date or earlier hatch date each year. In in graph C in the lower left uh, represents this represents the data from uh, graphs A and B combined. So the dashed line indicating a baseline measurement. Uh, so essentially, if Sanderling hatch date and insect emergence were perfectly in sync with each other, the orange line would perfectly overlap the dashed line. And as you can see, that's not what is happening. Uh, the data is actually showing a dramatic increase in difference between insect emergence and Sanderling hatch date. Uh, invasive species are a major issue throughout the world and in forests, uh, they present an issue for trees and birds and the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, most invasive species are generalist species that grow in most any condition and as a generalist species, they also thrive in disturbed areas such as a newly harvested forest. Uh, two of the biggest invasive species facing the uh, Ontario forestry industry right now are the emerald ash borer and the European gypsy moth. The emerald ash borer is from East Asia and infects and kills all ash trees by cutting off the nutrient supply of the tree it infects. Uh, with no uh, native predator, although some bird species like woodpeckers will eat them, uh, and, and, and also no way for the ash trees to defend themselves, uh, our ash trees are taking a heavy toll from, uh, from this invasive species. Uh, additionally, the European gypsy moth, which is native to Europe and Asia, uh, are severely weakening our trees through complete defoliation in areas where they are most abundant. Uh, the eastern, uh, sorry, the uh, emerald ash borer is a bit more difficult to control because the majority of its life cycle is spent under the bark, uh, but control measures for the gypsy moth include scraping their egg sacs off the bark of the tree into soapy water. Uh, forest plant invasive species include garlic mustard, dark, dog strangling uh, vine, and multiflora rose, just to name a few. Uh, these species create a monoculture of the forest floor and reduce our native species, uh, our native forest species, uh, drastically, uh, and reducing for food resources for birds and other wildlife. So, control measures for these plants include hand pulling and uh, uh, a direct point herbicide treatment. Uh, one of the biggest uh, potential issues involving harvesting an invasive species is cross-contamination from a site already infested with an invasive species. Uh, so a good forest management practice of the forestry, forestry industry is to power wash all machinery each time they enter a different harvesting location. Uh, 
Um, there are no numbers to uh, to provide that suggest how often this happens, but uh, we can use education and outreach to industry and landowners uh, and to request that the machinery is uh, the machinery is being washed before entering the forest to reduce the uh, spread of invasive species. Uh, from an economic perspective, any forest invasive species management incurs a cost in time and money. Uh, assuming the invasive species doesn't naturalize in the long term, these costs could um, could be extrapolated to tree growth and quality. Um, ash trees, for example, have already seen a reduction in market value, and some private landowners have eliminate ash trees before an infestation takes place so that they can maximize the market value of their ash trees. Uh, an economic study on the potential cost to taxpayers of removing emerald ash borer by removing ash trees uh, in Canada is just under $1 billion. However, this number only accounted for uh, urban areas and didn't take into account ash trees in people's backyards or in forests. Um, I would like to end this uh, this section by saying uh, it's not the sole responsibility of the forestry industry to reduce the spread of invasive species. Anybody that is hiking or camping during warm weather run the risk of spreading invasive species and should be taking uh, responsibility for, for their actions. So I urge everyone to, to wash your hike equi hiking equipment, especially your boots, after going for a hike and coming home from camping to help reduce the spread of invasive species. Um, and so finally, uh, a naturally diverse forest can uh, may be better suited to handle invasive diseases and pests. And so there is a theory in which a forest can resist invasive species through diversity in what's termed the biotic resistance hypothesis, and that, which suggests that forest communities with greater diversity are less invasive due to all ecological niches being occupied. So in this study shown above, the researchers uh, found that native tree biomass and diversity were two metrics to develop in order to build resistance to invasive species. Okay, so I think I've been pretty fair throughout this presentation regarding harvesting systems, especially coming from a, a bird, uh, bird background. Uh, and, and, and what their effects on forest birds are. So um, this will be the only time that I will blatantly go on the offensive and attack a harvesting system. Um, diameter limit cutting is aimed at primarily removing trees larger than 30 centimeters in diameter, and it's an all too common practice in Southern Ontario. Uh, an Ontario Woodlot Association study completed by Kim found that two thirds of Ontario private landowners use a diameter limit harvest as their primary method. In the graph on the right, we have the overview of those survey respondents separated by county that use um, that use diameter diameter limit cutting versus good forestry practice. So there are many reasons why diameter limit cutting is wrong. So for long term growth, this method of cutting is not uniform. You simply cut where there are large trees. What happens is parts of these forests are cut more heavily than others, and this creates an out of balance ecosystem, an ecological system. Um, the uncut areas grow slower and become overcrowded, and because the landowner has not thinned properly to allow room for growth. And over the long term, this results in poorer quality and smaller trees, ultimately reducing the financial benefits by thinning using good forestry practice. As a result of only cutting large trees, there are not enough large trees to capture the sunlight. Uh, this potentially reduces the high, a higher grade lumber, uh, meaning low sale market value that make up, uh, uh, that make up a mid tolerant and shade tolerant forest. So how does lumber become a lower grade by using a diameter limit harvest? Well, when the canopy is opened from a, from a diameter limit cut, this allows light to reach those smaller trees and those smaller trees retain those branches. Under, non, under natural circumstances, those branches would die and fall off from not receiving light taken up by those larger trees. Uh, from a market a value point of view, branches remaining on the trees are actually devaluing the lumber in their forests. More branches means more knots and knots in lumber means twisted bowed and poor quality lumber and therefore of lesser value. From an avian ecologist perspective, uh, diameter li limit cutting removes important old growth trees. If you were to look at the forest bird species at risk list for Ontario, the majority of those birds require old growth forests and this harvesting system may be a uh, part culprit in that. So the Ontario Woodlot Association also recently completed a study looking at the valuation of privately owned forests in Ontario. Uh, 
they concluded that under good forestry practices, privately owned deciduous forests have a valuation of about $1.1 billion. If good forestry practices were ubiquitous throughout the privately owned woodlots, the valuation of those properties would increase by more than $90 million. So why don't landowners convert to good forestry practices if the valuation would be greater? Well, uh, first, diameter limit cutting puts money in your pocket immediately without thinking about the long-term repercussions of the property down the road. Second, to further add to the first point, as a woodworker myself, there is a huge woodworking trend for live edge furniture pieces with which these large trees have a high market value and supply and demand dictate this trendy economic imperative. Uh, this breaches into a market that forest wildlife conservationists have never really been a part of or thought about, but it essentially brings in a group of people that use wood products as their livelihood. So do we wait for the trend to end or interject ourselves and use education and outreach to understand how we can change that continual trend? Um, this group, however, this, this group of people um, are less likely to alter their behavior because these products put food on the table and clothes on, in their, uh, and clothes on their families. Ian, just want to give you yes. a time to check. You have about 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, I have like three slides left, so we're good. Thanks. Um, so how can you become more involved with birds conservation? Well, be, first of all, become citizen scientists. Uh, birds Canada has so many citizen science programs for every skill levels and experiences. We have programs like Project Feeder Watch for birding beginners, as, or we have the Forest Birds Monitoring Program for more experienced birders. Uh, even if you're not familiar with your birds, uh, make it a goal to learn just one new bird by watching it for a couple minutes and write down or make a mental note of the color, shape, and size of the bird and use a field guide or the Merlin or download the Merlin bird, the free Merlin bird ID app to learn which bird you saw. Uh, and to help uh, build your bird ID skills, the Forest Birds Monitoring Program will be doing bird ID workshops this winter. So go and follow Birds Canada on social media or become a member of Birds Canada at birdscanada.org to receive notifications about when that will take place. Um, no person after watching a Blue Jay uh, for some time has not been interested in their eccentric and, and aggressive behavior at the bird feeder. So another way you can get involved is the third iteration of the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, and that's starting in 2021. Uh, these are extensive surveys covering uh, most of Ontario. Uh, the surveys are conducted by uh, citizen scientists and bird biologists all across the province. Uh, the best part about these surveys is we train you to do the surveys. We teach you how to complete the survey, and if you're new to birding, uh, you get your first taste at doing bird, uh, these bird surveys that contribute to initiative to track breeding, population, breeding bird populations throughout Canada. Um, there are two other atlases that are currently running at the moment uh, in Newfoundland and Saskatchewan. So if also, if you're a young person looking for experience into the birding world, this is an excellent opportunity. So you can register uh, at the link on the slide. Uh, in a moment, I'll copy and paste um, uh, uh, both of these, uh, uh, both of these uh, web addresses into the chat box. So anyone who is interested in, in becoming a volunteer uh, for the Ontario Bird Atlas, uh, Breeding Bird Atlas can, can, get that, can get that link there in the chat box. Um, you're also more than welcome to, uh, to email me directly and I can provide you with that information. All right, so I, I thank you very much for your attention and I will take any questions that you may have and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so yeah, any questions can go into the chat. Um, we'll just give it a minute to see if any pop in, but that was very informative, Ian, thank you. Oh, we actually have a question in though. Um, Heather was asking, does development in wetlands, um, provincially, provincially significant ones, affect migratory birds? And in what ways, if you could expand? Um, Development in wetlands. Oh my God, yes. Um, yeah, um, backfilling is a huge, huge problem with uh, wetlands and migratory birds. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a major issue in some areas um, and trying to protect those, those provincially significant wetlands. Wetlands in general is like an 80% decline in Ontario. Um, I think that's, we've been slowly increasing with Ducks Unlimited at the forefront of that, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there. I, I don't know how much I can expand on that because yes. <laughs> um, um, is there yeah, a, is exactly. 
I was gonna say, is there a particular way in which the development's impacting these birds then? Is it like- they, um, they It's more of just area? loss. It's loss of habitat, yeah. It's loss of habitat. Backfilling in wetlands is a loss of habitat. So it's, that's how it's affecting uh, uh, those migratory birds. And it, you know, a, a wetland provides, um, uh, provides habitat, not just for wetland birds uh, or waterfowl or anything like that. Like a, a lot of birds use wetlands for stopovers for feeding and water, right? It's, you know, blackbirds, uh, all blackbirds use wetlands, especially during migration. Okay. Generally, uh, okay, so, so is there anything that can be done to stop cottage development in pre provincially significant wetlands? Are you aware of legislation or, or programs? Um, I, it's wetlands is not my forte, so you'll have to excuse my thinking, uh, you know, my delay in response here. Um, in my, my experience, uh, you know, you can use things like the Migratory Birds Conservation Act, um, uh, you know, assuming you've identified identified species at risk on these areas and any other sensitive species at risk. Um, that could be used to, to help stop cottage development on SWs. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I can't really to expand too much onto that because it's beyond my knowledge base. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Heather. I can't answer <laughs> in a full, fully. <laughs> Perhaps we can, um, is there anyone in your organization that works more closely on wetlands? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, Doug Tozer is our, our wetlands person or uh, Kathy Jones. Okay. Um, you can contact them if you just, uh, you can Google search them, Birds Canada, Doug Tozer, Birds Canada, Kathy Jones, you should be able to get their information. Um, and you can uh, contact them about, about this question for sure if, you, if you're looking for some action to take. Cool. Um, I was also wondering then, uh, more back to the forest birds, uh, where your area of expertise, are there any particular success stories between forest bird populations um, that you've worked on? Um, yeah, actually, uh, for my master's, there's been some successes there. So um, during my master's, uh, I was, I was looking at incidental take of forestry from uh, of forest birds. Um, and so if no one's in familiar with incidental take, it, it means the, the destruction uh, or killing or destroying of a bird's nest or eggs during the breeding season. Um, and so what, what I did for my masters was we had a harvester do a single tree selection harvest during the breeding season. And it was my job uh, as, as well as my uh, technician's job to find as many nests as we could find uh, before they had harvested this site and monitor those nests to find out if they had been destroyed by the harvest. And it was actually a lot lower than we had hypothesized. So we, we sort of suggested that because it's a single tree selection that we would expect to see, um, because it's a single tree selection, which takes 33% of the trees, we could expect to see 33% of those uh, the uh, nests uh, being destroyed from that activity, but it was actually closer to more like five percent. So it was significantly, uh, significantly reduced. So there are successes, uh, which is why I'm more prone to help with with uh, uh, harvesting. If I were to see the opposite of that, like obviously a clear cut is is a completely different story. If you're going to do a clear cut during the breeding season, um, that's a completely different story. You know, hundred hundred percent of the trees is going to control destroy 100% of the nest, essentially. But yeah, there's there has been some successes personally, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's always a, um, nice to hear. Um, yeah, yeah. I did notice um, another question come in about, oh, I went too high. Um, some of the harvesting types that you spoke of impact ground cover and shrub understory. How does that play a role in insect populations and bird communities? Um, actually, I had <laughs> I had all of that in my presentation immediately, and as I was timing it all out, I was like, "Oh, I gotta re get rid of stuff." <laughs> it's like this is way too long. Um, so yes, uh, like I had originally wanted to talk about, especially soil compaction and how that played uh, an impact, and it was it, it it was more of an ecological impact, overall ecological impact in terms of uh, tree growth um, with species like um, 
like the oven bird I mentioned quite a bit uh, is a ground nester. Um, Eastern towhee is a ground nester. Um, Viries are another ground, uh, like low to the ground nester. Um, you know, you're going to see, you're going to see it. Uh, uh, you're going to see some uh, effect on, on those birds uh, before and after a harvest. Um, the oven bird, especially, it's a very, very sensitive bird, um, and it's really keen on those mature forest, untouched mature forests. So, uh, it definitely plays a role in those communities. How it affects insect populations, I couldn't, I couldn't um, uh, begin to answer that, unfortunately. Um, I imagine it has a similar. Um, it might have a similar negative effect, especially if uh, if that's all being disturbed and destroyed, kind of like uh, kind of like you know the the initiative to not rake your lawn from the leaves and and to, you don't use leaf blowers and things like that to uh, to keep those to to increase or, or benefit uh, insect species. I can imagine that the same uh, the same things would apply there with the with the forest with harvesting. Fair enough. So it looks like I know we're a little past 12. If you don't mind sticking around, we have two questions um, and then we can wrap. Is that okay? That's fine. I had a snack before we came. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, make sure so, I wasn't starving. <laughs> <laughs> One question was, um, are forestry efforts coordinated between Northern and Southern Ontario? I'm not sure if that's a question for you or something that um, I can get back to them on later. Yeah, um, as far as I know, uh, not that I'm aware of, I'm, I'm not that, um, I'm not that in tune with the forestry industry to like, I mean, I work with, you know, in Southern Ontario and I try to stay a little bit more localized around here. Um, so I'm not sure of what the back and forth between Northern and Southern Ontario is in terms of the forestry industry. I imagine there are, is coordination. I'm just not, uh, you know, I'm not in, in that as well. Yeah. And we can follow up on that in the response. Cause I was like, I, I know that sustainable forest licenses and Managed between yeah exactly like yeah there's different there's different types of harvesting for like there's different manuals for northern Ontario and southern Ontario for how you harvest in, in those areas so it's yeah it's, it's, so Leona we'll get back to you on that one um but Andrew asks what uh ooh, what do you think about nest searching as a mitigation method used by industry and consulting companies during breeding season um it's kind of like the survey before cut yeah nest searching um it's a good method. Uh, nest searching is a good method. Uh, I think that um, nest searching is giving you, assuming they're monitoring uh, afterwards, like just finding a nest. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's confirming a breeding occurrence. Um, I assume, I'm hoping that they're monitoring because then that gives you a little bit more information if that, uh, you know, for, um, uh, the survival rate or productivity of a bird. And so I would like to think that um, industry or consulting companies are doing some monitoring as well and not just confirming breeding location uh, in those circumstances. Um, yeah, point counts would be, point counts or some type of population survey would be also beneficial there because then you can assess the change of a bird abundances pre and post harvest. Okay. And I did see another question. And I think this might be more for something that I follow up on last, after Ian, but I'll just say it out loud in case. Um, there one, uh, Susan is wondering if private landowners are required to have a certified tree marker for harvest of tolerant hardwoods. Um, uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, if you have a private land, then it's, it's up to you how you want to manage that property. Um, some choose to have a management plan and contact a forester and have that all put in place and others, uh, others choose to do it uh, on their own. So it's, uh, I think it would um, depend too, so if they had a, a MIFTIP plan or a managed forest tax incentive program plan, they would be. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think they have to have a managed forest plan in order to get a MIFTIP. Uh, you do. in order you to be approved or yeah uh, okay. yeah so um and so if they want to get any kind of tax incentives from the province then they have to have a forest management plan and have to work with a certified tree marker or forester um but if that's not the case in in a lot of areas and especially in southern ontario a lot of uh, uh a lot of landowners are are they're 
their bread and butter is agriculture. So they just happen to have a woodlot on their on their land, and the the tax incentives that they get from from the province for agricultural land is much higher than than the managed forest tax incentive plan. So they opt for that option instead. Um, but there is works in uh, in looking how we can separate that so that you have to apply for both. And Carolyn made a good point. She mentions it depends on your municipal tree bylaws as well. So there's a lot that of too, yeah. yeah, that's quite variable across all across Ontario. And then just before we wrap up, Andrew did follow up um, about the, the searching for uh, tree nests. He said it's not monitoring, it's just to make sure the nests weren't destroyed during the cut. So I know that they are required to go out beforehand to look for nests, um, presumably. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I guess that's what you're looking for. And I'm, I'm not sure if, um, if that, ref Andrew, if that refers to all nests or if it refers to uh, certain species. Uh, so a lot of the times they're looking at just stick and cavity nests and um, um, great blue heron rookeries and, and things like that. So it's, um, I'm, not, I'm hoping it's all species. And so, you know, if you're just looking at stick and cavity nests and, and heron rookeries, okay, yeah, Andrew just said all species, yes. Okay, so that's good. That's good because you're, you know, you're, you're missing warblers and thrushes and everything else in between right so that's good okay great well we're a little over 12 now so i don't want to keep everyone too long uh so say thank you again ian for the presentation it was thank very you. informative lots of thank great you. comments in the in the web chat lots to think about okay. i um, hope you all enjoyed it thank you so the session is recorded we're going to be monitoring it um sorry monitoring editing and we'll post to the youtube channel but we'll let everybody who is here know when it's live um, so thanks again. Everyone go have a fantastic lunch and uh, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.